Welcome everyone to this sixth day of our 16 day virtual ABS conference. We hope you've been enjoying the conference and that you've had a chance to participate in the small group workshops on participation and discourses which have been running this week. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of hearing a presentation by Dr. Glenn Cotton titled Authentic Dialogue, Moral Empowerment and Civilization Building. In our session, uh, Dr. Cotton will discuss the nature and characteristics of authentic dialogue in light of the Baha'i writings, and also in connection with the work of Dr. Sona Farid Arbab, William Hatcher, Elena Mustakova Posart, Martin Buber, David Bohm, and Paolo Freire. Some epistemological and pedagogical implications of this concept will be explored with special attention to the value of such dialogue in education that aims for what Dr. Farid Arbab terms moral empowerment. We will also consider how authentic dialogue is applicable to Baha'i community building activities and efforts to address social polarization and America's most vital and challenging issue. So let me first just briefly introduce our presenter, Dr. Cotton. He received his PhD in education from UNC Chapel Hill. His dissertation's findings reveal how authentic communication and dialogue, especially across social divides, stimulates moral and community development. He lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife Ishik and had the bounty of serving at the Baha'i World Center for three years. His career as an educator has included teaching English for academic purposes and training future teachers at universities in Turkey and China and he currently teaches English as a second language at the Community College in North Carolina. He has presented at the ABS conference before on the topic of truth, beauty, and goodness, three interconnected aims of true education. Without further ado, I now turn it over to Dr. Cotton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julia. Um, and uh, welcome everyone to my presentation on authentic dialogue, moral empowerment, and civilization building. Uh, this presentation is about a way of communicating I call authentic dialogue. It's also about the central role I believe this way of communicating and relating must play in promoting moral empowerment and building the new civilization envisioned by Baha'u'llah. Finally, I will consider the relevance of these ideas to addressing what Shoghi Effendi calls America's most vital and challenging issue. In other words, the work of eradicating racial prejudice from American society. Uh, for my dissertation, I studied a Baha'i inspired educational project at a US public high school, which was designed in the founder's words to bring together the uptown kids and the downtown kids. That is students from wealthier, usually white families, together with students from low income families who were predominantly students of color. And to generate authentic dialogue and community among them. Judging from the transformations many of these students who participated said they had experienced, it's fair to say the project was successful. And one of the key ingredients my study found accounted for this success was the kind of communication the, found, the project's founder and facilitator was able to foster between the participants in his workshops. One of the students I interviewed eloquently described uh, the kind of communication I'm talking about in these words. People were sharing what they felt and I was certainly listening to their words, but to me, they were kind of washing over me. And I think that's what made me cry harder. I hadn't realized there was more under the words. I felt like I was swimming and heading to a place that I couldn't even imagine. I just felt like I was really hearing that person, not the words, but hearing the person. 
she went on to dis- to characterize this experience as quote a state of mind or state of heart with other people where you feel like there is no me or you there is us it's just this higher state of being it's not connecting and it's not coming together it's like letting your outer shell go so you can see the connection that was already there. In my study, I termed this kind of communication, authentic communication. And my findings showed how experiencing it has a powerful, morally transformative effect by promoting what psychologist Elena Mostakova Passart calls critical moral consciousness, which I'll talk more about later. So what is authentic communication? What is authentic dialogue? In my study, I defined authentic communication as uh, communication that aims for truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, Let me explain. How does authentic communication aim for truth? Well, authentic communication is inherently truthful, stemming from a strong desire to understand, to know, and be known by the other. It begins when one's defensive, judgmental, self-concerned, sometimes even deceptive, stance towards the other is replaced by a stronger desire to listen to and understand the other. Engaging in such communication requires humility, openness, and courage to speak one's truth and change one's views. When such communication explicitly aims to discover truth, in other words, to gain a deeper, fuller understanding of any aspect of reality with others, then it becomes what I call authentic dialogue. How does such communication aim at beauty? Uh, Authentic communication and dialogue seek beauty in the sense that this kind of communication recognizes and honors the unique value or beauty of each participant. Also, when communicating authentically, we aim to co-create a beautiful conversation in the same way that jazz musicians carefully listen to each other as they improvise and seek to contribute just the right notes from their their instruments at just the right time in just the right amount to create a sublime musical moment. And how does it aim at goodness? Engaging in authentic communication and dialogue is an inherently moral act. And I, I see more, uh, goodness and morality as being uh, synonymous in this case. Um, so uh, yes, it is an, inherent mor- is an inherently moral act that fosters restorative justice, love and unity in human relationships. We can also see how these characteristics are similar to the qualities Abdu'l-Bahá says are the prime requisites for consultation. In other words, purity of motive, radiance of spirit, detachment, attraction to the divine fragrances, humility and lowliness, patience and long suffering and servitude. Authentic dialogue is based on and at the same time promotes authentic relationships. Indeed, they're practically the same thing, only distinguishable in that each term emphasizes a different facet of the same phenomenon. So what are authentic relationships? In my study, I defined it using the same terms I use to define authentic communication and and dialogue. For me, a relationship is authentic when it is motivated by one's concerns for truth, beauty, and goodness. 
by defining authentic communication, dialogue, and relationships in this way, I'm hearkening back to Plato's observation of human nature, that it is our concerns with truth, beauty, and goodness that distinguish us from other creatures. For Plato, truth, beauty, and goodness are what the human soul, as distinct from our lower animal nature, thirsts for. Another similar understanding of what makes relationships authentic is found in William Hatcher's book, Love, Power, and Justice, The Dynamics of Authentic Morality. In this book, Hatcher argues that our relationship to any aspect of reality is authentic to the degree that it is based on an accurate perception of the structure of reality. And that because the supreme intrinsic value of hu that humans possess, um, uh, and, that, and that because of the supreme uh, intrinsic value humans possess, quote, the mark of authenticity in interhuman relationships is the presence of self-sacrificing love and altruism. Uh, the philosopher Martin Buber also perceptively pointed out the difference between authentic and inauthentic relationships, though he didn't use those terms, by observing that there are essentially two ways of relating to others, one which he called I-it and the other I-thou. In an I-it relationship, the ego sees itself and others as separate objects in the world competing for survival, comfort, advantage, status, etc. When the other is viewed as it, he or she is a thing among things, evaluated in terms of how it either benefits or harms I. Thus, I relates to it as a means towards his or her ends. In an I-thou relationship, the other is not a means towards my ends, but an end in herself or himself. She or he is no thing among things that I can presume to understand and categorize, but rather is uniquely other and, quote, fills the firmament. In other words, to use religious terms, when I see the other as thou, I see him or her as a unique reflection of God. When comparing these three views on what constitutes um, authentic human relationships, uh, we see a common pattern. Uh, in all three views, that is my own Hatcher's and Buber's views, uh, relationships and communication become authentic to the degree that those relating and communicating are able to detach themselves from their self-centered concerns and fears, from prejudice and imitation. In other words, from all the attachments our sacred writings tell us to detach from. To relate and communicate authentically with others is to free ourselves from the prison of self and come to see in everyone who may cross our path the image of God reflected. By striving to communicate and relate to others authentically, we grow morally and spiritually. Um, especially Buber's idea um, connects with um, an, um, something I observed in my, in my research. Um, Buber's idea um, uh, that in an I-thou relationship, one recognizes the precious otherness of the other relates to what I, what I called the otherness-oneness paradox in my research. The paradox was this. Although the program I studied explicitly aimed to help participants, quote, experience their oneness, 
and indeed was quite successful in doing so, as the words I shared with you at the beginning from one of the high school students I interviewed uh, attest, attests. Nevertheless, to experience oneness, participants first needed to give up their assumptions that they already understood the other and instead approach them without prejudgment as unique and different from themselves. Only in this way could deep listening and connection occur, allowing them to discover their true humanity and experience their oneness. I want to move on and discuss how the ability to engage in authentic dialogue is related to psychological, moral, and spiritual development and maturity. A number of theorists have suggested that an outstanding characteristic of mature human consciousness is its capacity for and commitment to dialogue. Two such theorists uh, who have significantly inf influenced my own thinking are Paolo Freire, Freire and Elena Mostakova Posart. Uh, Freire understood the aim of education to be uh, to help learners develop critical consciousness, uh, which is awareness, uh, the awareness that society and culture are human creations rather than facts of nature. And therefore that a mature human being is one who takes responsibility to actively intervene in the world to improve it rather than accepting it as it is. And according to Freire, people develop critical consciousness as they increase their capacity to enter into dialogue, not only with other men, but with their world. Uh, similarly, the, the Baha'i psychologist Elena Mostakova Posart, whose theory of critical moral consciousness provides an expanded uh, psychological explanation of the stages of critical consciousness development Freire suggested, also describes people developing critical moral consciousness as ones who, quote, enter into ongoing dialogue with life, spurred by a quest for truth and justice. What I'm calling a spirit of, or what I do call a spirit of uh, dialogue is prescribed by Baha'u'llah as well in many places in his writings. Uh, here, here are three examples. Uh, the idea that a capacity for and commitment uh, to engage in authentic dialogue is a characteristic of maturity is confirmed by Baha'u'llah in, in this statement. For everything there is and will continue to be a stage, a station of perfection and maturity. The maturity of the gift of understanding is made manifest through consultation. Before I go on, uh, you may have noticed that uh, what I'm calling authentic dialogue seems very similar to what our sacred writings call consultation. And indeed, uh, in many, perhaps most cases, both terms can be used to refer to the same thing. The reasons I'm talking and theorizing about authentic dialogue rather than consultation are that I want to relate what Baha'is call consultation to the extensive body of thought and dis discourse that exists on the topic of dialogue, going all the way back to Plato. Also, Baha'is have tended to limit their understanding of consultation to what can be seen as a subset of what I'm calling authentic dialogue namely dialogue whose purpose is to reach a decision in a collective course of action or on a collective course of action. However, one of the things I'm trying to get at in my account of authentic dialogue is that the spirit of dialogue is not limited to collective decision-making, 
but also denotes a way of living. So I'll go on now to share the other two quotes. Um, the dialogical approach to life a mature person takes is also alluded to by Baha'u'llah in his description of the true seeker. Here we see a quote from the Seven Valleys, uh, specifically the Valley of Search, where Baha'u'llah says, in this journey or on this journey, the traveler abideth in every land and dwelleth in every region. In every face, he seeketh the beauty of the friend. He joineth every company and seeketh fellowship with every soul. And again, we find a profound description of what I'm calling a spirit of dialogue in that wonderful hidden word in which Baha'u'llah admonishes us never to exalt ourselves over others, but rather to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. Not only is the maturity of the individual characterized by an inclination to engage in dialogue, but the collective maturity of humanity, I argue, is similarly characterized by the spirit and practice of dialogue. Indeed, the age of humanity's maturity we are entering must necessarily also be an age of dialogue. Abdu'l-Baha calls this time in history uh, the time for the ingathering of the scattered peoples of the world beneath the shadow of the almighty tent of unity. The scattered groups of people that make up our human family each have distinct story, uh, collective stories, have acquired unique wisdom and produced unique cultural innovations from which the whole of humanity can benefit. Furthermore, in the age of humanity's immaturity, the value and voice of only a small portion of humanity has been honored, while the value and voices of many others have been denied and suppressed. Yet God tells us in the Quran that he made us into nations and tribes that we might know each other. The practice of authentic dialogue, in other words, true consultation, is essential, I propose, to establishing true restorative social justice. Indeed, authentic relationship and dialogue embody the justice and love and promote the mutual understanding, respect, and healing upon which true unity is built. Uh, the practice of authentic dialogue also has some important epistemological implications. Epistemology being the branch of philosophy concerned with knowing. In other words, uh, what standards we use to justify saying we know something. Uh, one such implication is pointed out by the physicist David Bohm, who argued that one of the profound benefits of dialogue is that it helps us to recognize our own usually subconscious assumptions through encountering people whose assumptions are different than our own. Dialogue, he said, is a space where we may see the assumptions that lie beneath the surface of our thoughts. These assumptions become habitual mental habits that drive us, confuse us, and prevent our responding intelligently to the challenges we face every day. 
Furthermore, the greater the number and diversity of perspectives we take into consideration, the more complete our understanding becomes, as the famous story of the blind men and the elephant demonstrates. Another epistemological implication is that we gain a fuller, more holistic view of reality when our search for truth merges with our concerns for beauty and goodness. This merging of the pursuits of truth, beauty, and goodness occurs in authentic dialogue, as I've explained earlier. The central finding of my dissertation was that experiencing authentic communication and dialogue across social divides appeared to powerfully stimu stimulate the moral growth, specifically the development of critical moral consciousness of the high school students I interviewed. Uh, with regard to the discourse on Baha'i inspired education, this finding leads me to the question of what implications might this finding have for how education can foster uh, what Fundayak and Sona Farid Arbab refer to as moral empowerment. Uh, in her book, uh, moral empowerment, Farid Arbab suggests that moral empowerment can be understood to refer to both the aim and the process of Baha'i inspired education. Uh, specifically, uh, moral empowerment refers to the process by which one develops capacity to develop one's twofold moral purpose, to transform oneself and contribute to the transformation of society. This idea, uh, so, so since uh, um, authentic dialogue both requires and promotes moral growth, and since one of the essential qualities of a morally empowered person would seem to be the ability and inclination to engage in authentic dialogue, I propose uh, that the practice of authentic dialogue should be a central feature of education for moral empowerment. Uh, this idea also has re relevance for Baha'i community building activities. Um, indeed, uh, dialogue is central to the method of education employed by our Ruhi study circles and junior youth empowerment programs. And we can surmise that the more authentic the dialogue that occurs in these contexts is, the more effective these activities become. Uh, furthermore, our capacity to, to successfully engage in the meaningful, elevated, intimate conversations the House of Justice calls on us to engage in with growing numbers of people depends on our capacity to relate and communicate authentically with others. Finally, I want to consider uh, the relevance of the idea and practice of authentic dialogue to America's most vital and challenging issue. In reflecting on, on the section of the advent of divine justice in which Shoghi Effendi identifies racial prejudice, as our most vital and challenging issue. And especially on this part, where he describes the differing responsibilities of white and black Baha'is in relation to this issue. It occurs to me that Shoghi Effendi has perfectly described here what authentic relationships and dialogue look like between people occupying different positions within an oppressive, unequal social system. I'm trusting that most of us have read the passage as I have been 
uh, rereading it quite a bit, uh, in, um, re especially recently. Uh, so I won't uh, take time to read it now, uh, but we can return to it if you wish to examine um, its precise wording uh, more closely during our Q&A session. What I do want to do is uh, offer these implications I see of Shoghi Effendi's words for how authentic dialogue and relationship can develop between members of socially advantaged and socially disadvantaged groups in an unjust society. Uh, to create authentic dialogue between members of a socially advantaged and, and disadvantaged group uh, groups, in an unjustly structured society, uh, Shoghi Effendi seems to suggest that the members of the advantaged group must continually examine themselves and recognize and abandon any sense of superiority and or patronizing attitude they find they may have towards the other group. They must take the initiative to reach out to and foster authentic, intimate, genuine friendships with individuals from the disadvantaged group. They must take the initiative to educate themselves in order to better understand and sympathetically respond to the grievous and slow healing wounds the other group has experienced and continues to experience. He also suggests that the members of the disadvantaged group must respond with warmth and willingness to let go of their suspicions and grievances. And then he lists uh, some qualities and actions required of both groups. Neither can think that anything short of genuine love, extreme patience, true humility, consummate tact, sound initiative, mature wisdom, and deliberate, persistent, and prayerful effort can succeed in blotting out the stain of racism from our country. All of these qualities, of course, contribute to authentic relationships and dialogue. In other words, positionality, uh, the way one's position in a social system influence one's perceptions and beliefs matters in authentic dialogue. Of course, we can and should derive strength from understanding that we are all ultimately spiritual beings, inextricably connected with each other. But we must take responsibility for the position we are born into within a sick, oppressive society. Some of our responsibilities will therefore differ depending on our positionality. For example, Shoghi Effendi seems to give the primary responsibility to initiate authentic relationships in this context to members of the white group. In other words, the group occupying a relatively privileged social position in American society. He also emphasizes the grievous wounds of one group, not the other. That, that uh, may be because as he explicitly states elsewhere, it is the attitude and, and prejudice of, of one group that has wounded the other group and not vice versa. Still, he gives both groups the shared responsibility to develop the quote, genuine love, extreme patience, true humility, consummate tact, etc., needed to resolve this issue. So I'm going to uh, end here, end my presentation here. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. I'm looking forward to um, engaging with your questions and comments in a spirit of dialogue.
I stop sharing? Thank you so much, Glenn, for your presentation and for all the thought provoking ideas you've put before us. So I encourage all the friends who are joining us and there are about 200, I understand, who are joining us uh, today to please share your questions and to do so, uh, please scroll down and click on add comment and you can simply ask your question that way and they will be shared with us. So our first question, how do you see the model of progressive cycles of development recommended since at least Rizvan 2015 by the House of Justice supporting the practice of authentic dialogue? Well, yes, I, I see that they absolutely support it. Um, uh, whenever, I mean, I've, I've mentioned already that the, the emphasis that they put on the quality of the conversations we have, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, meaningful conversations, elevated conversations. Uh, in the most recent message, uh, the 2020 July message to the American Black community, they say intimate conversations. Mm. Um, all of these things are references to what I studied, I think. And, and so I'm just hoping that, that uh, these ideas that I've, sh I've shared today just can give us a, a, a hopefully um, a, a, a fuller or clearer sense of what that might, what those words might mean. But I certainly interpret them to mean uh, to be very much uh, about authentic dialogue, a call to a call to engage in authentic mm -hmm. dialogue. Uh, I'd you. also actually I'll also say that um, our our the the idea that we to participate we are to participate in the discourses of society, uh, we are to engage in social action, and, and we are to do this with like-minded people who are not mm -hmm. calling themselves Baha'is. And who have different perspectives, and and to, to to do that effectively, it begins with uh, authentic relationships and and in uh, an authentic dialogue. And so, in that vein, what are some of the challenges that you have encountered in the education process, uh, for example, with teacher education um, mm -hmm. for authentic dialogue? Okay. <laughs> Well, the biggest challenge, uh, perhaps, is that people aren't used to it. <laughs> mm. You know, so as I've as I've already um, said, uh, uh, that that it's, it is it is, if this is something that is an aspect of mature human consciousness and mature human society, uh, it is something that is uh, still rare, mm. you know, and difficult, because it goes it goes against the the ways the ways that we've been taught to engage with each other. Uh, uh, yeah, boy, in, in, in the academy, for example, uh, especially, uh, you, you see the emphasis is on argument and debate and not, and not on dialogue in my, in my experience. Though originally the academy, if we go back to Plato, it was all about dialogue. Well, and so moving to the arena of institutions, how have you seen authentic dialogue nurtured within institutions, whether they be regional or international. And I'm not sure here if the question is referring specifically to Baha'i institutions, but I suppose you could address whichever category you, you wish to address. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm taking it to refer to, um, to Baha'i institutions, but I'll, I'll try to think about both. Uh, so for Baha'i institutions, it, it really uh, uh, comes down to uh, the study of what it means to consult. Mm. Uh, and of course, we have some wonderful guidance on that. And we have uh, book 10.2 in the, of the Ruhi books. That's all about consultation. It's a beautiful, uh, beautifully done book. Um, and so uh, I think that's uh, we just we uh, we need to be uh, we need to realize that it's not an automatic and easy thing. We need to realize that it's something we need to conti continually be working at because it's something for uh, it's a uh, like I said a quality of mature humanity that that we are we're standing at the threshold of maturity, but we're you know we haven't uh, we're we're striving to get there, but it's a uh, we're we're at the embryonic stages of that. But we need to, but at the same time, I'm not saying that as an excuse, we need to be urgently working on it to be effective in, in the world. Um, and so for, 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 for Baha'i, for institutions outside of the Baha'i community, I think it's the same, 
Mm -hmm. same thing. It's just it's just uh, maybe even a little little bit more work that would need to be put into it since since even the you know consultation is not a as we understand it as Baha'is is not is not so, so familiar um, out, outside though though there are exceptions to that mm -hmm. there, there are some institutions that that uh, are are doing it and so with regards to the Baha'i community and where we are at today where do you what do you think are some of the steps that we could take to evolve further with respect to authentic dialogue? Maybe there are specific areas of endeavor that you could comment on where you feel either we've really moved or these are areas where a lot of development is needed with respect to authentic dialogue. Hmm. I think uh, we have to realize the profoundly spiritual and transformative nature of the engagement. I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we're, if we're really doing authentic dialogue, authentic relationship, consultation, uh, we are transforming ourselves in the process. And if we don't feel that happening, uh, we need to go deeper. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need to really, um, and that, that includes, you know, the self-examination that, that, um, for example, the, the, that, that Shoghi Effendi alluded to in, in Advent of Divine Justice, the, the, the genuine desire, actually this was expressed um, rather nicely and succinctly in, uh, by Stephen Covey in his uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Or he said, one of those habits, as I recall, was something like, I'm gonna paraphrase, but something like, um, uh, seek first to understand rather than to be understood by the other. Uh, and if we if we do that, if it, it's it's basically a shift. It's it's it is a coming out of our ego. Mm -hmm. right? We're not defensive. We're not so concerned about oh he ha I have to make them understand me. You know, mm -hmm. but stepping back and saying okay, I really really want to understand where she is coming from or where he is coming. Now, given that dialogue is often messy and difficult, and now we're raising the bar and we want it to be authentic, we want it to seek love, beauty, and goodness, should we expect that it's not necessarily going to feel good? And if it doesn't feel good, and if it's messy, could we take that as a sign that, you know, it's, it's, it's good trouble or that, it's, or that we're growing? So can you speak to that feeling of... Um, of the, of, of the complicated side of it and how people inside of this dialogue with good intentions, but maybe getting it wrong, mm. what are those feelings that we might expect to feel? Mm. I love that question. <laughs> First, let me say that. Uh, beautiful. Um, uh, and the, uh, simple, the quick answer is yes. <laughs> mm. You know, we, we, we should expect uh, that there will be all the human emotions involved. Uh, there, there will be, um, uh, uh, in, in a way, it, 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 in, in some way, it'll be similar to the, the um, experience of um, repentance in some ways, you know. Mm. Um, not that we, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm not saying we, we um, confess, you know, <laughs> to, to, mm. to, to each other, you know, but, but, but the, the, the sense of really, really having the humility to see, to, to recognize when, when I'm, uh, what I'm saying is hurting somebody else. Mm -hmm. What should concern me is, is the hurt that I'm causing, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to remedy that or to, 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 to step back. And um, it, we, we need to engage with it, in it with actually, uh, Martin Buber said this in when, he, when he described the I and thou uh, relationship this is coming from his famous book, by the way, I and Thou, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and um, he was, he, he said that uh, one of the things he said about the I Thou relationship is that it requires the engagement of your whole being, mm -hmm. which I think is absolutely uh, a be beautiful way to, to say it. And, and that's what authentic relationship is also, you know. There's a question that's coming in also on this theme of race amity, um, asking about 
is there documentation of the race amity conferences in the early 20th century that we can look at them from the perspective of authentic dialogue and consider whether, you know, what, what results came out and could we say that what was taking place was authentic dialogue? Is that, mm. is that possible to, to look at them in that light? Uh, it's a wonderful question that I have not researched. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I, uh, boy, that's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great resource topic. <laughs> so I to, encourage- To be somebody, continued. <laughs> yeah, I encourage somebody to take that up, yeah. Well, someone is asking, maybe you could share a little bit more about the nature of the dialogue that the high school students participated in. It sounded like in your presentation, you were excerpting from Mm. Uh, th those dialogues. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, so um, it was uh, the the um, the founder of this project, um, uh, who was a Baha'i, uh, is a Baha'i. Um, he uh, he he was in a uh, he, he he worked within the school system, and he uh, took it upon himself. Uh, this the, the purpose of the project was was. Um, to to address the um, achievement gap, uh, and and so um, it really the workshops that he developed were the heart of the project. Uh, he also um, out of that workshop he he had um, this kind of peer tutoring system that he that he um, uh, he he created where where he would put to, uh, maybe the he would pair a more advantaged student with with a disadvantaged student. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and and the, but but on the basis of a of a profound friendship that they would have formed within uh, in the context of the uh, the workshops, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so what else can I say about the workshops? I thought that that quotation was so eloquent. That was from a the one that I shared at the beginning was from a uh, junior high school uh, uh, female uh, white uh, student. Mm -hmm. who uh, um, was just really experienced a total change in her life uh, as a result of as a result of this one workshop experience um, and uh, and there were also they, I mean there 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 were others um, uh, that that uh, were from you know various backgrounds that also uh, including African American uh, that uh, and Hispanic that also um, in their interviews said the same thing, basically that they, how, they, how they experienced it. But this one particular student really described the kind of communication so eloquently. I, I used her, her words to, mm -hmm. to describe this, this experience of, of um, I mean, the, the, the founder called it the experience of oneness. He, uh, he arranged the, um, the workshop in such a way that, well, first he, introduced the idea that it was possible to experience oneness. He had some quotations that he shared and some stories that he told that attracted the students to, to, um, to the possibility uh, of, of experiencing this together. He helped to presence, he used the word to presence a lot. He helped to presence their, the, the suffering really caused by their estrangement from each other, mm. you know, of, of these cliques, these cliques in the high school. Um, and uh, and uh, then, um, uh, and then he had the, the, what he called the sharing portion of the workshop, which was uh, kind of a, the climax where uh, he, he opened it up with a little clip from, um, uh, this wonderful documentary of the, the color of fear mm -hmm. that uh, you, some of you may be familiar with uh, of, a, of, of, a, of another similar workshop uh, to a few decades earlier of, between men from, from racially diverse uh, groups. Um, and, uh, and then that, 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 uh, that so that, was, that, that, that played the role of really a kind of um, uh, what did, what did Frary, Frary had a name for this thing, um, and I'm, I'm not remembering it right now. But but when you use something that kind of to frame the whole discussion, and mm -hmm. and 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 to 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 bring up to 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 to, work, to really get people to examine themselves, uh, and and then and then the sharing happens, and and uh, there's a lot of tears. Um, 
there is a kind of an ethic of care that is that is uh, reinforced uh, by simple acts like you know passing the tissue box to to a student mm. that's crying and 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 so this this ethos of care of caring for each other is uh, developed yeah so I'll, I'll stop there well this is actually a a, a nice segue into uh, a, um, a series of questions actually that are asking about you know, what conditions need to exist in order to protect the less privileged or the less advantaged populations, because we can, you know, people may feel different in that setting. And so I want to yeah. combine that question along with the question about, you know, to what extent can we say that the process of dialogue is even more important than the outcome? So, so yeah. centering ourselves on the, 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 the manner in which people are feeling in that space and mm -hmm. how do we even know what are the conditions because people may be coming from different um, um, yeah. they have different sensibilities, different readings of the situation. So how do you create a space in which you can reasonably expect that that mm -hmm. person will be capable of feeling that they are part of an authentic dialogue? Mm, yes, very, very good question. Um, so the, uh, well, one of the conditions that is, and I'm not the only person to, to notice this. I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a recognized um, by uh, practitioners of, of uh, this kind of, you know, doing this kind of work, uh, group work, group therapy, you know, et cetera, um, diversity work, mm -hmm. um, uh, racial justice work, um, is, is that there has to be safety. Mm -hmm. And and but then you know what how how do you how yeah. do you do? That? Um, I mean, it really. Uh, I think one of the ways is that uh, really you the the whoever's facilitating the process has to model it. Uh, so so and in fact that's exactly what happened in the workshops I I was uh, studying. Uh, that that the facilitator was quite what well, he was the one that initiated the authentic relationships. It was his authentic relationship with the students there that was the first authentic relationships that inspired other students to start to relate to each other mm. authentically, you know. Right. So, so the facilitator needs to model it. Um, it's also helpful to have some rules. Uh, and actually, it's very, I think it's a rather crucial actually to have some, some, uh, some ground rules. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's, uh, I mean, uh, you, there's, I've, I have some co collected some different ground rules um, that, that uh, uh, in fact, right now there's, uh, I'm in this Willamette Institute uh, course on anti-Black racism, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a really nice set of ground rules. I wish I had printed it out. I wish I had thought of that. I don't have it handy, but it's a really, it's a really very, very nice and eloquent set of ground rules. Uh, I've been in other groups where, uh, actually, recently I was in a group where where um, the facilitator asked us to um, us to come up with the ground rules, mm -hmm. saying, "What will it take for you to feel safe?" Uh, and everybody, and we and we ended up coming up with a very a very uh, I thought very full, a very nice and complete uh, list of of rules that we set for ourselves. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's important that that uh, you have that kind of structure. And I suppose somewhere in the midst of that dialogue, it would be interesting to check in to see, you know, has your experience been one of authentic dialogue? Maybe the person you're speaking with is not feeling that way. So yeah, absolutely. I guess absolutely. there's this kind of iterative process where you're kind of checking in, constantly checking what in. you're experiencing, right? Yeah, ch constantly checking in. There's also the kind of what is the takeaway. You know, mm -hmm. there's that that ending with an opportunity for everybody to to share. I think the way the way we allow people to share is also very important. Uh, recognizing who hasn't shared, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's again uh, a, a skill, a facilitation skill. You know, and and uh, I think also specifically with regard to uh, when there is an advantaged and disadvantaged group or or a group that's oppressed. And a group that's really uh, in the position of the, the the members of the group that have historically been the oppressors. Um, that um, 
we need to there, there there needs to be a space needs to be intentionally made for the for the voices that have been that have been suppressed to 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 have the space to be heard and for perhaps even actually not even perhaps i think especially for for the majority of the time mm. uh, of uh, especially at the beginning of the process to be given mm -hmm. to that to that group uh, to 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 share their experience and you, so in, moving from dialogue to action, because the, the two are intimately related, there's a question about what then is the role of action in authentic dialogue? Mm, okay, um, very, very good question. Um, and they are connected, uh, it, especially, I, I, did, I did define authentic dialogue as, as um, communication that aims for truth, beauty, and goodness. And of those three, the goodness one especially relates to action. You can't separate it from action because goodness, what does it mean to be a good person? You know, mm -hmm. this is, um, of course, um, this is the, it, it comes, the, the, I, I'm, I'm taking this, like I said, from Plato, you know, it goes back to Plato. Uh, he said, these are the three dimensions of human existence, the desire for truth, the desire for beauty, the desire for goodness. Um, so goodness is about morality and morality is about action. I mean, I mean, you can't just have armchair morality, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, moving now back to, from action uh, to dialogue, there's a question about um, noting that the ABS reading group on race and, um, and, and Africanity has been studying this issue of treating others as possibly damaged or needing mm. protection. And the question whether does such an attitude then reproduced as unity because it creates this expectation of greater and lesser capacity that there's a population that we're now going to extend a special protection to in this conversation. And so is this something that then happens or they're asserting that it's something that happens despite best intentions. And so how would you comment on that good intention but perhaps having these undesirable results? Hmm. Well, that's this is getting into the complexity of it, of course. Um, good, that's good. <laughs> yeah, which is which is good, which is good. good. And, and uh, oh God, so can you repeat the beginning of the question again? I'm so sorry. it's coming from the ABS reading group on race and Africanity. It's asking yeah. whether treating others as damaged or needing protection, mm. whether that then creates or reproduces disunity based on the expectation of greater and lesser capacity and differential capacity. And that they acknowledge that this can happen despite the best of intention, but right. that it may result in some groups feeling um, uh, marginalized or less than right, right. in the community. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna go back to the standards of, of, that are given to us in the writings. You know, uh, anything that causes us to in any way exalt ourselves you know, or feel exalted or uh, over the other is, is uh, something we need to undo, something we need to um, dismantle, you know. Um, and uh, so, um, so, so, and, and, and that uh, part of that would be seeing the other as damaged, you know. Now, now one way to, and yet, and yet one way, uh, I mean, we are damaged, right? You know, and, and, and we're not, and, and, and the, the, but, but if we frame it in such a way that, that the, the oppressed group is the more damaged one, then we are falling into, mm. we're in the wrong paradigm there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think what we have to realize is no, we're all, we all have things we to overcome. And we all are hopefully, you know, striving together to, to, to become what Baha'u'llah wants us to be. And so how can we help each other? Uh, and so in that, in that situation, uh, we acknowledge damage, but it's not my looking at your damage or, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know it's, a, it's a more of a together, it's a communal, a, a communal sense. And, and, and not dwelling on the damage too much. I think, I think that uh, we can make a mistake there too if we, if we uh, if and, and and I think also it's not for me to uh, uh, yeah well definitely definitely it's not for any one person to comment on what they see as the damage of another person mm. uh, that that would be a grave grave error. 
uh, th then the then the problem again is like Abdul Baha said, you know, the the imperfect eye sees imperfection. Mm. So we have to look at our own eye in the in such a case and not and not uh, the uh, the other. Yeah. Well. Thank you for tackling that question. And I think we ended on a question that really took us into some of the complexity, to yeah. complexities and maybe messiness of this, but I, I, I think you're leaving us with a lot of food for thought and, um, mm. and just appreciation of the difficulties involved, but certainly worth. By the way, can I just say that, that uh, um, you know, I did have the, the bounty of, of looking at, of watching the Africana group, uh, Africana studies, um, Africana studies group, you know, what is the, what is knowledge um, mm -hmm. you know, discussion. And uh, it was, uh, um, I, I felt it was uh, profoundly connected with, with, uh, I, 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 I was, I was, it was, it was so heartwarming for me because it, it you know, they were saying exactly that, you know, that the kind of approach to knowledge that, that uh, is the Afrocentric approach to knowledge is exactly what I've been trying to uh, in my work trying to highlight with reference to different Western, you know, Western theorists, but I'm gonna, I think it's be more useful maybe to uh, directly, uh, yeah, to, 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 to bring in more of the um, Afrocentric uh, uh, thinking, thinkers, you know, into that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That actually, the, that presentation from Saturday has come up in several other sessions I've been in, so. I also want to give a shout Beautiful. out if you have not seen it yet to please uh, to please tune in. So uh, we're a little bit over time. So I just want to give a big thank you to Glenn for your presentation and also for everyone who tuned in and for your excellent, um, excellent question, which uh, questions, which made for such a rich discussion. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you to everyone and um, wishing you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>